Gormagar Kiancorla, and I want to use my 10 minutes to go over and back with the Minister uh, in terms of questions rather than making a statement. Uh, Minister, my first question is in relation to older people. So, over the last number of weeks, we have been given different time frames in relation to when the over 70s will be inoculated. It was March uh, when we expected that the AstraZeneca vaccine would be used for the over 70s. And obviously now we all expect the time frame to change, but we've been told it could be April, May or June. So can you confirm to the House today for the purposes of clarity and on the basis of the information that you have, what is the estimated time frame for fully inoculating all of the over 70s? Thanks very much, Deputy. Yeah, so as you know, as, uh, on Monday, we're going to start with the over 85s, or sorry, 85 and older. Then we're going to go 80 to 84, 75 to 79, and then 70 to 74. So they're the, they're the, the tiers we're, we're doing it in. It starts on Monday. Um, the schedule I have would suggest that uh, the, the group will have finished their second doses uh, in May, by mid-May, but as always, these things are dependent on the supplies arriving in. But if we get the supplies that are forecast, and as we all now know, these, the, the, these things go up and down, it would be around mid-May, uh, second dose complete. Okay, and, and I accept that there are supply issues, but the middle of May for all of the seven, over 70s to be inoculated is a long time for those most at risk to be waiting. And I think that will cause concern for many older people. I know that the GPs are ready to play their part. Pharmacists tell us they're ready to play their part. Uh, there are community vaccinators, I'm sure, who can play their uh, part as well. So it's obviously very difficult when we hear that we were hoping it would be the end of March. Now it's the middle of May, and it might be uh, longer. Can I ask you um, a second question, Minister? And I raised this with you last week, and I have to raise it with you again. And that's the issue of family carers. And I've spoken to hundreds of family carers since you responded to me last week in the chamber. And what you said is that family carers are not being seen as a distinct cohort in and of themselves, as a distinct cohort of, of people who will be uh, vaccinated. And I have to say they're very angry and they are very sore about that. Your response was that carers who work for the HSE and carers who work for private providers are seen as a priority and will be in priority too. But family carers are not. And we're talking here about people who care for very vulnerable children. And there are many of them, and there is uh, one I want to relay to you. It's one of hundreds I've got. A Geraldine who is caring for her son on a full-time basis. He has profound disabilities and is non-verbal. And he has been informed that he will be in the COVID vaccination group seven. He needs care 24 hours, seven days a week. His parents are 66 and 68, and they're worried about what will happen to him if they get uh, COVID. And the question has been asked, who cares for the carers? So can I ask you, Minister, in the spirit of what has been said to us in the past, uh, that the allocation groups can be re-looked at and revisited? And given that family carers feel very sore and feel not very valued, I have to say, when they hear the responses that they have heard, can you relook at this? And can you ask the National Immunisation Advisory Committee to relook at this? Because I think they're a cohort in and of themselves that need to be valued, need to be respected, and need to be listened to when they are telling us of their experiences in the way that they uh, have. Minister. Thank you very much, Deputy. Can, if you don't mind, can I just very briefly go back to the 70s and older? So the timelines that we were talking about before the decision on the MNRA vaccines, the end of March was that the first dose would have been complete. Because we're using Pfizer and Moderna and the supplies are different, that uh, process has shifted, lengthened by about two weeks. So it, it's, not a, it's not a shift from March to May. Uh, March was the, was the completion of dose one. That's now shifted just about two weeks because we're using the, the MNRA vaccines. Um, specifically to carers, I, I, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, we had a meeting uh, yesterday, Minister Butler and myself, 
with a lot of representative groups representing older people. We, we had uh, carers organizations there as well. Uh, I, I've had a lot of representations, as, as I know we all have. There is nothing I would like more, and the rest of us would like more, than to have uh, no supply constraints at the moment, to be able to do all of these groups who do such incredible work, because the, the fears that you raise, the case you raise, uh, we're, we're all aware of many cases like that, and they're very, very real concerns and very real uh, care. I asked the HSC specifically to this point, because we, we've debated it in the House a few times, um, for a clinical judgment on it. And remember, the decision that they're making on a clinical basis is on the basis of the principle being use the vaccines to protect the people who are most vulnerable. So hence the long-term residential care setting, uh, hence starting with the 70s and older, because the information we have obviously is they are, they are high, highest risk. Um, and so as more vaccine becomes available, we will of course be moving on to people who are family carers as quickly as we can. But the, the clinical judgment we got in terms of um, protecting those who are directly most at risk themselves was as we had laid out here before. But it's in no way to, uh, to talk down the, the, incredibly, the incredibly valuable work they, that they do and the very real concerns you're articulating. Can I, say to you, can I say to you, Minister, that doesn't answer the question at all. Because the question I put was, are they going to be considered as a distinct cohort in their own right? And I think they should be. And obviously you have looked for a clinical assessment. I don't know what that assessment has been. And I think it does have to be underpinned medically. But they are people that we all recognise are doing a lot of work. And of course the person that they care for needs to be vaccinated. But they can't be cared for if the carers themselves uh, get sick and get COVID. And that's the point. And the other point is that we draw a distinction, or at least you do, and the government does, for whatever reason, that carers who work for the HSE and private providers are treated differently to family carers. And I don't accept that's the right course of action. I want to put another question to you as well, because it has come up an awful lot. And that's people with medical conditions that, who need treatment, and in many cases, life-saving treatment. And their consultants and health specialists are saying to them that they will not proceed or cannot proceed with their treatment because of the risk of them contracting COVID. There is one individual that I'm dealing with who has multiple cancer lumps and he needs a mix of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. There are many more representations I've received, I'm sure you have, I'm sure others have. I spoke to Dr. Colm Henry of the HSC directly on this. He says that he made a recommendation to the National Immunisation Advisory Committee. There are patients who need kidney dialysis and that's also coming up on a regular basis. These are people who need life-saving treatments and interventions and supports. And yet their clinicians are saying to them, I'm very fearful about going ahead and doing this if the patients are not vaccinated. So can you explain to me or can you confirm to me if that issue has been resolved? because it would be absolutely unacceptable if somebody wasn't able to get the life-saving treatment and interventions that they need because they cannot be vaccinated. Yeah, thank you, Deputy. I think, I think it's one of the most important questions we're, we're dealing with in the vaccination programme right now. <clears throat> so I've asked the Department of Health and NIAC to take a look at the prioritisation. Uh, given what we now know about the vaccines, given that it's now underway, uh, I don't believe we can, we can make changes to the prioritisation often. I think if we're, if, if we're making any changes, you know, we probably do it once. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy with the, the position that you've raised. Uh, I've made my view on that clear to uh, the Department of Health. At the moment, NIAC is doing a very detailed piece of work uh, on exactly the group you're talking about. Currently, it's cohort seven, which is quite a large group. Um, but within cohort seven, that's people with underlying conditions. But I think to your, your very point, there, are, there is a group within that who are really, really high risk and it's really, really urgent. So over the next few days, um, NIAC will be reporting back, we'll be looking at that. And that's what I was referencing earlier in, in my opening statement was, I, I wanna be able to report back to the house, ideally next week on, on exactly the point you've raised. And I hope, Minister, that we get progress on this issue, and I think everybody would accept that's an urgent issue. The final question I have for you is category six key workers. 
So because of the decision in relation to AstraZeneca now not being used for the over 65s, they're going to be the second next category that will be inoculated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. There is still no definition of what is a key worker. So has that work been done? Because we're being asked about it. We have a lot of key workers or people who see themselves as key workers are asking us, where do we sit? What is this definition? When are we going to see the detail? And we haven't seen it. And yet, it's, they're going to be very quickly uh, part of, of the rollout. So can you uh, very quickly, if you can, explain to us where that is at the moment? Very briefly, Minister. Yeah, very briefly, as part of that same exercise I was just referring to in terms of those with underlying medical conditions, we're looking at, at, at exactly that as well. So key workers, essential workers, uh, and so forth.